Good afternoon, everybody. This is Tim Gleisner, Head of Collections at the Library of Michigan. Here today, uh, speaking about one of our Michigan Notable 2020 Award winners, Abigail Pesta, for her book, The Girls, by the Seal Press. And we're here today uh, to discuss the book. I've, and again, if any of you are uh, willing or able or wanting to support the Michigan Notable Book Program, please contact our Library of Michigan Foundation, uh, whose uh, contact information can be found in the opening and ending credits of this segment today. And with that, I'd like to welcome Abigail. Abigail, how are you today? I'm great, thank you. How are you? I am good. Um, folks, just to tell you on a personal note, this is a very timely book, um, but it is a difficult book to read because of the subject matter. If you're not aware, this is about the uh, legal case against Larry Nasser, the gymnastics doctor in Lansing, Michigan. And um, as I start with every talk, Abigail, I'm just wondering if you could please uh, talk to us about your background and how you became a writer. Yes, first of all, thank you so much for having me and thank you for spreading the word about the brave women in this book. Um, they told their stories to help other people recognize the signs of a predator. So um, thank you for helping, helping them get that word out. So I started writing as a kid in Southern Indiana. My parents ran a small town newspaper, the Brownstown Banner. And um, I had a lot of assignments as a kid one of them was to write a weekly column, and it was interviewing a, a person in the community about their favorite recipe, but really it was, it was an interview about their life, you know, about who they were and what they enjoyed, and it was tough for me as a kid because I was a shy kid, and I was nervous about interviewing adults, and um, a lot of them would say, oh, I don't have anything interesting to say. <laughs> and so it was my job to pull stories out of them. And what I found was everybody has a story to tell. And um, that's how I first learned that lesson. <laughs> you know, you just have to talk to people, get them to open up. And so that's how I got my start. And then I went on after college, I went to New York and then London and Hong Kong. I worked for newspapers and magazines around the world but I was really mostly editing. And I got back into writing um, when I, I wound up at Glamour Magazine as an editor there. And um, I recruited Marianne Pearl to write a column for us. She's the widow of Danny Pearl, the Wall Street Journal reporter, okay. who was kidnapped and killed in Pakistan after 9-11. And I knew that Danny and Marianne wanted to build bridges across cultures. Danny was a journalist, Marianne was a filmmaker. So I thought she'd be the perfect person to do this column that we wanted to do, telling the stories of women changing the world. And we sent her to a different country every month. And she told these phenomenal stories of women fighting for change, you know, just making a difference in so many ways. And I got very interested in these stories and I started writing stories like that myself. And um, I just was fascinated by people who overcome tremendous hurdles in life and, you know, that resilience and that perseverance they have to go on. And I found this common thread, which is so many people who have been through something unthinkable, they want to use their experience to help other people. And so that's why I first got interested in telling these kinds of stories. And that's what eventually led me to do this book. So, so your reason for writing then is to tell the stories of people who are undergoing hardship, is that correct? Um, I just, you know, that's a good question. I like, yeah, I like human, deeply human stories. Um, stories about people's lives. And I do gravitate towards stories of people who have overcome something and how, you know, what is it about the human spirit that helps people get through unthinkable things? And then what do they do with it? You know, a perfect example, when I first started writing these kinds of stories, I interviewed a young woman who had been sold into a brothel as a child in Cambodia. She was, she had to work as a sex slave from the time she was a little girl. She was rescued by a humanitarian named Somali Mom. And um, I had met this girl soon after she had been rescued. And she was so shy and just so beaten down. She could hardly even meet my eyes, you know. And then I saw her again a couple years later and she had transformed. I had never seen a human being transform so much. And I, I did an interview with her about her life and she was becoming a humanitarian herself. 
helping rescue other girls from brothels. And I thought, wow, you know, what a triumph of the human spirit. She's going back into these dark places to help other girls to save them from her fate. And, you know, it's just, that's the kind of story that I like to tell because we all have challenges in our lives. Sure. Most of us don't have that big of a challenge, but we all have hurdles we're facing, things we're trying to deal with. And I think it helps when you read stories of how other people have gotten through difficulties in their own life. You know, I think it helps all of us figure out how we can, you know, manage what's going on in our lives. So let me ask, how often do you write? How often do you find subjects like this that you feel compelled to write about? Um, fairly often, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. And people always ask, well, how do I find these stories? I, they, they come in various ways, but um, often just through talking to people or sometimes people reach out to me because they've read other stories um, you know it's uh, but yeah I write for magazine I write magazine articles and um, you know for instance um, I did a feature a couple years ago that was it was so interesting it was about a young woman who had um, grown up in London and she got she was a um, she got interested in jihad as a kid and you know because she grew up in a muslim family and she was all confused about all the cult you know what was going on around her culturally she wound up marrying a, a texan who was a jihadist the two of them went off to fight jihad he became a you know a leader in isis and she as she grew up realized oh my god i don't want this and she had her children and they were in syria and she escaped she got them out and she ended up um you know getting herself to Texas with her kids and de-radicalizing herself. And now she helps de-radicalize other people. And that story came to me just through, you know, I met a photographer. We were on another assignment together. She mentioned that she had an old friend who was dating this fascinating woman. And, you know, so <laughs> the stories come in different ways. But um, that's just an example of how, you know, I, what, you know I, I met this phenomenal person just from talking to people. Well, leads me into how did you get the idea for this book? I mean, it's in the middle of the country. Do you have any ties with Michigan? Have you heard something about this? Um, well, I grew up in the middle of the country. I grew up in Indiana. Okay. <laughs> um, but you know what it was? I did, a, I did an interview or pretty early on in the Nasser scandal with a young gymnast named Lindsay Limke. It was an interview for Cosmopolitan Magazine. And she was one of the first... Um, survivors to publicly identify herself as a survivor of Larry Nassar's abuse. And I sat down with her and her mom, and it was so interesting to me because here they were. They, Lindsay had grown up with this trusted doctor, Larry Nassar. Um, you know, he had, be, he was the Olympic doctor. She and her mom thought he was the greatest, and he was so nice to them, and you know, she felt honored to be treated by him. And she had been a kid when he treated her. She didn't realized that what he was doing was abusing her. He was pretending to treat her while abusing her. So here are Lindsay and her mom wrapping their heads around this idea that this trusted doctor had abused Lindsay for years, like hundreds of times. And I remember they said they were getting blamed, you know, that people they knew were posting on Facebook. Why didn't the parents know? Why didn't the kids tell? And I just thought, oh my gosh, here's this family grappling with this, you know, unthinkable situation and they're getting blamed for it and I thought well let's help people understand how this happened what it has meant for the family so that's when I first began thinking about it and then that's if it, it eventually grew into a book because I felt like there was a lot of confusion how did this doctor manage to sexually abuse girls for almost 30 years you know who were the enablers how did it happen how did he evolve? So, you know, but it started really with Lindsay and her mom because when they said they were getting blamed, I thought we need to help people understand this. Hmm. So let me ask, uh, so there were a couple of uh, different types of culture that you really had to like, I don't wanna say immerse, but definitely get into. How hard was it get, to get into the culture of the gymnastics world because that, Right off, that struck me was the culture of that world 
basically was just something that I had never even envisioned before I read your book. Like it never clued into me that there was this, yeah, I mean, just a culture that never I had thought of before. Yeah, um, it's a really good question. I, I think we all have a sense that, well, of course, you know, to become a top gymnast, it's tough training and you have to be super strong and competitive. I had no idea <laughs> and it, until I began talking to these women. And the very first person I interviewed for the book, Sarah Teresi, um, as I was interviewing her, we came to realize she was probably the very first known survivor. She had never told her story before. She had met Larry Nasser back in the late 80s at a gym in Michigan. Um, and she really helped me understand this extremely brutal environment. And, um, you know, she was growing up at a, in Michigan, going to a local gym there. She wasn't looking to become an Olympic gymnast necessarily. She thought maybe she could get a college scholarship. And even still, it was like a boot camp. You know, she described it as brainwashing. The, the coach, she had this coach named John Getter. He went on to become an Olympic coach alongside Nasser, the Olympic doctor. And um, she said he, you know, he told the kids if they were injured, it was their fault um, because it meant they weren't concentrating. And so the girls would get injuries. They would have fractured bones and, you know, all kinds of serious problems. And they wouldn't tell because they thought it was their fault. You know, I spoke to one young woman who trained and competed with a, a fractured elbow and a fractured me, I mean, it's just unbelievable. So, you know, she, she, and then the many others I spoke to, you know, I spoke to 25 um, survivors eventually, most of them were gymnasts, but you know, he got his hands on girls across the Lansing, Michigan community, dancers, volleyball players, cheerleaders, you know, so it wasn't just gymnasts, but he did, he, he got his start at a gymnastics gym in Michigan and he did over the years primarily target gymnasts. But, you know, the women I talked to over the decades just gave me a sense of this very brutal environment that really set these girls up, you know, as perfect prey for a predator because they were, they were belittled and berated. They were taught to fall in line, not to speak out, not to complain, not to cry, not to even say if they were injured. You know, one young woman told me she, um, she got punished for getting injured. She fell off the, um, and even bars at a practice and she was punished. She, her, her face was bleeding and the coach told her to sit in the over splits, which are extreme splits where you elevate one leg up on a chair, you know, so you go down lower than the regular splits. Right. That was her punishment for getting injured and she had to sit there for a half hour or something. So that's the kind of environment a lot of these kids grew up in. And so when Nasser came along, <laughs> you know, he learned to become like, the nice guy he wasn't at first but the women show how over the years he evolved into this um, master predator who would make the girls think he was helping them and he was their friend you know so they'd be brutalized in this training and it wasn't just the, you know the local gym in Michigan this is happening all over the country and um, but that's you know it really created this environment that enabled him to prey on these kids so can I ask the other thing that really stood out to me in this book was the community, Lansing itself. You mentioned several times about kind of a tight-knit community, MSU being a real, you know, institution of institutions in the community, and just really in many ways a lot of people knew each other in many different facets of life. Uh, how would you define Lansing as a place, as a setting in this work? Uh, how did it figure in your work and in, in, in your reporting? Um, well, I really, you know, it just felt, it felt very personal because I had grown up in a small town in Indiana and I, I had grown up doing gymnastics too, just at the local girls club, not at any kind of hardcore gym whatsoever. Sure. And, you know, and I loved it. It was fun. It was not competitive at all. And I thought that's how gymnastics should be. But I could see how as a kid, you could catch that bug. You would want to keep going and doing trickier tricks and you know so I understood that and um, I really I felt like a lot of the women who I spoke to they told me they felt they had not been heard because um, they felt like the media focused on the Olympic gymnasts because Nasser was known for abusing Olympic gymnasts 
but he abused hundreds of kids who came through this gym in Michigan. And, um, you know, it just felt, it felt personal, like it was to the Lansing community. I mean, I know it was shattering because here was this trusted, um, renowned Olympic doctor in their midst and come to find out he had been preying on kids all this time. Um, so I wanted to tell that story because I felt like um, it, it just, the story of how, what he did to this community, how he got his start there and how he was enabled there over the decades by the coaches and people who looked the other way. Um, you know, I just felt, felt like that was a very important part of the story that we, we just weren't hearing as much. Um, these women just revealed groundbreaking information about how he, over the decades, evolved into a master predator, starting with that very first known survivor telling her story for the first time. Um, he started volunteering in the late 80s at a gym in Michigan. It's called Great Lakes Gymnastics. Um, he was a medical student at the time. He went on to become um, a doctor and a professor at Michigan State. And then he went on to become the Olympic gymnastics women's team doctor. Um, and all the while, he was volunteering in Michigan. Um, he went on to volunteer at um, Twist Stars Gym, which was owned by the coach, John Gettert, who became the Olympic coach. And in the back room of this gym for decades, almost 30 years, he was abusing kids. You know, so um, I just wanted to tell the story that hadn't really been told. Many of these women had never told their stories. Some of them didn't even realize they had been abused until they saw some of the other women stand up in court. And that's a really important thing, too, because a lot of the women had just buried the trauma. You know, it's a childhood trauma, and they had either buried the memories or not understood as children that they were being abused. So to realize then as an adult, you know, in the 30s or 40s that, oh my God, this happened. You know, for them, their story began after NASA went to jail because that's when they were grappling with the reality of what had happened. Some of them had kids themselves. Sure. You know, and so they're dealing with this um, trauma from their past. So there were a lot of stories that I felt weren't being told. The women themselves told me <laughs> weren't being told. And there was such... You know, I came to see such power in these stories because it was interesting. They all said they, they were telling their stories to help other people. They, they really felt like if they could use their terrible experience to help other families avoid that fate, then they had done something good. And that's what's so powerful and so important about their stories in this book because, you know, I interviewed women through the decades from the very first to the very last known survivor. Um, a high school girl who saw him just days before he was arrested. Um, and they show how, over the years, he evolved. And, um, you know, there's real, there's real power in that information. There's power to stop future predators. So here you are. You're entering the world of gymnastics. You're entering the world of the city of Lansing and East Lansing. What do you think was the hardest part of the whole experience of researching and writing this book? Um, it was, you know, it was very emotional hearing these stories. What was interesting to me was a lot of the women said it was actually kind of therapeutic for them to tell them, you know, because some of them had never told them before. Sure. You know, and so to sit there and some of these interviews went on for hours, days, months. And the very first known survivor, I spoke to her over the course of months because her memories were coming back as we were speaking for the book. Um, so... You know, it's hard to hear stories of people being manipulated and abused, but also I have to say, I found so much inspiration and power in it too, because again, these women all came together, you know, they came together and defeated a monster <laughs> and they were all moving forward and using their experience to help other families, to help other girls. I mean, that says so much about the human spirit. And so for me to be able to help them achieve that, that was just, it's a phenomenal feeling. But what was also challenging was the time frame. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a lot of time to do the book. Um, understandably, the publisher wanted to get it out while NASA was in the news because that's when you have the best chance of people reading the book. And we want people to read these stories and stop this kind of thing from happening in the future. 
So as a writer, you always want more time. You always want more time to finesse. Um, so <laughs> that was challenging. But um, I just wanted to make sure I built in time to share the stories with the women um, before we went to press because they're so deeply personal. Sure. Um, you know, the women in this book range from, you know, age 15 to 45, you know, and like I said, some were sharing their stories for the very first time and, and some of their parents were talking to me and I wanted to be sure everyone felt good about what was going in the book. Um, I just didn't want anyone to worry about that. Um, so I built in time to show everyone and it was so interesting to me. I, you know, everyone said that's what I wanted to say. And um, so, you know, I felt like, okay, then <laughs> we've done a good thing here. So what was your time frame? How long did you have? I think I had about eight months. <laughs> really? That's all? And I mean, you're in New York City, you're going to Lansing. I mean, how often were you back here in Michigan trying to write this book or get the um, research done? A couple times, you know, not nearly as much as I would have wanted. And, um, you know, I just tried to meet as many people in person as I could. A few interviews I had to do by phone, but most were face to face. And, um, you know, it just, um, and I was hoping to get back to Michigan for the library tour. <laughs> um, but we were too. We were I'll hoping you were going to come yeah. too. <laughs> when things open up, I'll be back. Um, so that was really challenging because, I, like I said, I spoke to 25 survivors and the people around them, their families, their parents, um, as well as um, you know, the legal, some of the attorneys. Local attorney Jamie White was tremendously helpful. He represented a lot of the women, and he was a real key player in getting a settlement from Michigan State. You know, um, so yeah, it was a lot of interviews and, and a lot of people, and not a lot of time. So um, that was challenging. But as long as the women felt good about what you know what was going into the book, I felt I felt good about it. Okay, so let me ask the title, the girls. What's the significance of that title for you? I think it's really important because I don't think a lot of people realize these were mostly kids. He really preyed on kids and a lot of them didn't understand they were being abused. He told them it was a medical treatment. He was an osteopath. He would say, if I manipulate one part of your body, it'll help another. And he would be sexually abusing them. And they were kids, so they didn't know. And he took advantage of that. And sometimes he would even, you know, he had so many tactics for ensnaring these kids and he would groom the kids and their parents. That's the key here. You know, he would groom entire families. He would sometimes have a parent in the room while he was abusing the child. And the parent wouldn't know because he would block the view, put a towel over the child. And the kid would think, well, everything must be okay because my mom or my dad is here. And now those parents are devastated and learning that this is what was going on and they had no idea. But another interesting thing too is um, some of the girls did realize they were being abused over the years and they did tell. They told coaches, they told counselors, they told the police. No one listened to the girl. Everyone believed the doctor. And I think there's such an important lesson in that. Um, you know, starting back in the 90s, girls started reporting him. Larissa Boyce says she told the coach in at Michigan State and, you know, was dismissed and, and disbelieved and sent back to the doctor's lair. And, you know, she described, she said the coach didn't tell her parents, but instead told Larry Nasser. Mm -hmm. And so Larry Nasser called her, you know, she got in trouble then. And then she felt guilty. She was a kid. She thought, oh, she must have a dirty mind. So she got back up on his table and the abuse continued for years. And again, a few years later, a girl reported, she and her mom went to the police in Michigan and reported him. And the police interviewed him and interviewed her, and they just believed him. They went on, after Nasser was arrested, they apologized, you know, for missing it. But it happened again and again over the years. And that, that was very eye-opening to me, too, that while a lot of kids didn't know they were being abused, some did, and they told authorities and people in positions of power no one listened. They just believed the doctor. And I think there's a really, really important lesson in that, and that is listen to girls. Listen to what they're saying. Can I ask you, with these subjects, with these people, you know, the victims, how hard was it to find them? How hard was it to get them to talk to them? 
Um, it was really, you know, once I started speaking with some of them, I found that they would recommend others because once I could see that once they could see that they could trust me, then they felt like they could invite me to talk to other people. And so it just kind of built, you know, over the months as I started talking to a few um, others, you know, others would recommend other people to talk to. And I think it just became kind of a, it was sort of like a circle of trust, you know, they felt like, okay, they can trust me with this story and I would, you know, treat it respectfully that they could see the story before it was published so they wouldn't have to worry, would there be any surprises, would they be misrepresented, you know. So, um, so it was really just um, speaking, you know, speaking with women and, and as I went, having, you know, their recommendations for others. Um, Jamie White, the attorney I mentioned, he was very helpful to you, um, you know, in helping me connect with women over the, the decades, you know, people who could really show um, this, or this predator's evolution over time. So you've touched upon it, but what do you think the relevance is of this work? What do you, what do you think is the importance? Well, I think, um, for one thing, it really helps people understand how predators prey. So, you know, for other families, for other kids, you know, parents whose kids are in sports, there's a real, you know, there's so much to learn here and just thinking about who are they trusting with their kids, you know, um, the coach, the doctor, you know, a lot of these kids in gymnastics, well, these were big deal coaches, doctors, the parents trusted that they were in good hands. So part of it is, you know, a really important lesson in how predators prey and, and what are the signs, you know, Nasser became very good at, um, he would grooming the families, he would bring the kids gifts from the Olympics and make them feel special. He would tell the parents, I won't bill the health insurer because, you know, I see such potential in your daughter. And these parents didn't have a lot of money. They thought, how wonderful, this doctor sees potential in my daughter and he's not going to bill, you know, exorbitant bills to the health insurer. He had all these ways, um, which this book unveils, um, that help people understand, here's how a predator operates. And it also, the book also showed how over time, you know, in the beginning, as he was just gaining his footing with that very first known survivor, he hadn't figured all this stuff out. He was kind of mean to her. He wasn't nice to her. But then as you see the women over the years with their experiences, you see how he figured out, oh, I befriend the kids. I bring them gifts. I'd be nice to the kids. You know? And that's how I will get them, um, in, you know, ensnared. And he, as social media emerged, he began using that as one of his tactics. He would text kids. He would like all their Facebook posts, their Instagram posts. You know, he would just um, use every tool he could get his hands on to ensnare his family. So the book helps show how predators prey. It also shows um, the effect of trauma and how people deal with trauma because childhood sexual abuse, you know, it's such a trauma. And for the women who learned it later in life that they had been abused or who had buried these memories, you know, as they raise their own families, they're figuring out how to deal with their own trauma and how to tell their kids about it. That's another thing, to tell these stories, it takes such courage because they're going public with a very personal story and then everyone knows something about them before they even meet. If they're going on a job interview or a first date, that person's gonna know something deeply personal about them just from a Google search, you know? Right. So, so the effects of trauma and how to deal with trauma, that's another really powerful lesson. And just empowering survivors of abuse to know they're not alone that they can speak out and, you know, that they can, they can move beyond this eventually, but it's, you know, it's a journey. There's one young woman in the book who I, I just think is such a powerful example of, you know, that, that human spirit triumphing. She described how, she was a dancer, Grace French, and she talked about, you know, how Nasser abused her as a kid and she didn't even realize it. And even when he got arrested, you know, a lot of the women suffered from this sort of disassociation, like they couldn't leave. This, this nice guy, this trusted friend was a master predator abusing girls. And she said, you know, finally, when she saw the women standing up in court, it, it, you know, she finally could accept it. And, but then she went into this trauma, this spiral of nightmares that kept her up at night. She couldn't sleep. She couldn't stay awake in college during the day. 
and she got a dog. She got um, <laughs> she got a dog and trained him to wake her up from nightmares, and it made all the difference, you know. And I thought that story shows right there the power um, of the women in this book of finding ways to move beyond this. And now she has started an organization to help other survivors too. Maybe you already answered this, but like, what do you think was the favorite aspect of this book for you, or what the favorite outcome that came from this book? What, what for you was the most gratifying? Um, well, so many people have told me they they learned so much. They really had no idea because they'd read the headlines. It's impossible to keep up with all the news. All they knew really was that there was an Olympic doctor and he did abuse some Olympic gymnasts. They had no idea the depths of the story. They had no idea, you know, the enablers. That's another really key part of the story, too. John Getter, so many of the gymnasts told me they see him as a key enabler. Sarah Teristi, the very first known survivor, said she, he witnessed her abuse back in the 80s and didn't do anything except make fun of her. She said he made fun of her breasts, you know. So, you know, he has emerged as, and he's under investigation by the Michigan police. Um, but again, you know, there were so many enablers along the way that the women told me about that really um, had, a, you know, had escaped a lot of attention. So it helped unveil, um, you know, just the whole system that helped create this monster and who needs to be held accountable, who has yet to be held accountable. Um, so, but yeah, I think the book accomplishes a lot of things. <laughs> So you picked for the Michigan Medal of Book Award when you found out. How did you feel? How did that, uh, how did, what was your reaction when you found out that you became a Michigan Medal of Book uh, author? Well, it was such an honor. It is such an honor because, number one, library. You, it's nice to be recognized by libraries, you know? Right. <laughs> um, I mean, that's just the heart of everything we do as writers. and. Um, and it, you know, it just felt really special and really very personal for me because, you know, you can, um, you can get, you know, the book got a lot of coverage in the media, which was wonderful, but it, when a library selects you, selects your book, it's just, um, it's extremely meaningful because, you know, it's the real deal. <laughs> These are people who read books and love books and know, you know, so, but also because it's Michigan, because that was really the heart of the story, that's where, you know, that's where it was ground zero for Nasser and um, where he got his start and it's where he continued for so many years. And, you know, I know it was so devastating for the community, but also the, the community, the way people came together and stopped him and then continued, um, you know, to help others long after he went to jail and they're doing so still today. You know, Michigan's the heart of this story. Well, Abigail, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for sharing your story about how you wrote this book and how it came about. And for those of you, uh, again, my name is Tim Gleisner. We're here with Abigail Pesca, author of The Girls by Seal Press. Again, if you wish to help out uh, the Michigan Notable Book Program, please find the contact information for the Library of Michigan Foundation. Abigail, thank you so much for today. Thank you for everything we talked about. Do you have any parting words for us today? Well, just thank you so much for having me. And thank you again for spreading the word about these brave women. They're phenomenal and they are changing the world. <laughs> and so are you by helping me share their stories. Well, no problem. Thank you for your patience with not having the tour. And again, everybody look forward to another submission from the Michigan Notable Book 2020 program and have a wonderful day. Abigail, thank you again. Thanks so much, Tim. Take care.